Well, Tony, it's great to see you uh, in London and good, good to be discussing the most urgent existential challenge we face today, which is that of global warming and in the lead up to the COP in Glasgow. Uh, what I wanted to discuss with you today and get your insights and views on in particular was what I've described as the crisis within the climate crisis. And that is the need for more long duration storage, which is overwhelmingly pumped hydro. Uh, because we have a, a rush, uh, thankfully, of cheaper and more effective uh, variable renewable energy, wind and solar. But of course, they, are, they only work when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining. So you've got to have a means of storing that electricity uh, when, so it's available all the time. And while batteries are very effective for short duration, for long duration storage, we need more pump storage. And as you know, we've discussed it before, one of the projects I got underway here in Australia is a very big pumped hydro scheme, Snowy Hydro 2.0, which is under construction at the moment. But the thing that worries me the most about it, and you know, you and I both understand this as former prime ministers, is that long duration storage needs planning and governments the highly political governments particularly are often not very good at long-term planning because they're looking to the news cycle or the next election or you know next week and pumped hydro takes years to build because of all the planning and permitting and a lot of civil construction whereas variable renewables solar in particular can be rolled out literally in months so you know, how do you how do you see the this crisis within a crisis and the need for sustainable hydropower and particularly pumped hydro? Well, first of all, Martin, thanks very much for for, for doing this with me. And um, the World Hydropower Congress couldn't happen in a more um, timely moment than, than now. Obviously, a few months before the the big. COP26 summit in, in, in Glasgow in the UK, where really I think this is the last chance to make some, some serious commitments to the future. And um, look, I agree with, with, with what you're saying, that the idea of long duration storage is absolutely essential. Um, pumped hydro is going to be one of the principal means of, of achieving that. Um, and the question therefore is, is how do we implement sufficient projects at scale to make a real difference. Because I think what's happened in the climate debate, I mean, I was, I was prime minister when the Kyoto <clears throat> Protocol first came into being, and people forget this now, but back then, um, just over a couple of decades ago, there was huge resistance amongst many countries, even to the notion that they should take action on climate change. And there was still a lot of disputation around Climate itself, what was it? Was it was it really changing as a result of human activity or not? And you know, there was a fierce debate at the time the Kyoto Protocol was rejected by the American Senate overwhelmingly, despite the fact that um, the American president at the time, Bill Clinton, was in, was was in principle in favour of action. And we've moved an enormous way now, which is great. But what's happened is that just in these last few years as it's become more or less a matter of international consensus that the climate is changing, we need urgent action. So the, the focus has turned to, well, what are we going to do? You know, what, what's the answer to it? Because in the end, you, you've got to have answers that are practical and realistic, as well as radical. And that's, that's the, um, the, the challenge for the policymakers. And you know, as, as, as I've said over these last years, this is a moment when you've got to take the climate issue out of the realms of the NGO and the campaigners and into the realms of serious policy. Because ultimately, you can tell people it's a huge problem, but unless you can show people that there is a practical way to, to deal with climate change, then you know, if you're not careful, you're proposing measures that you find it very difficult politically to implement. So this is why the hydropower is so important because it, along with several other um, methods of combating climate change, it offers us 
the real possibility of, of the type of serious policy um, and serious implementation that we need. Because if, unless you have that long duration storage, as, as, as you rightly say, the um, other aspects of renewable energy simply won't meet the requirement of energy stability and supply. So this is this is the challenge, and it's why the um, the Congress is very important. The measures that come out of it are important, and why we've got to to look at what are the things you need to put in place in order to allow this accelerated investment and development of hydropower to take place. No, I, well, I, I agree. It's you, you, you're absolutely right about having to have practical solutions. It's uh, you know, people need to know that uh, you can keep the lights on and deliver abundant and affordable electricity and, and energy generally. Um, in your institute's paper, Mind the Gap, which looks forward to the COP and what can be done to make it uh, really effective, uh, you talk about the need, of, need to provide uh, clean and affordable energy in low and middle income countries and the, the, the need for the developed world to really show the way in doing that, because otherwise uh, reductions in emissions in the developed world will be overtaken, as they are to some extent, particularly in China, if you count China as a developing country, which is, it's, it's developing in parts, I think, it's, much of it is highly, is probably as highly developed as anywhere in the world. But nonetheless, uh, unless we can provide some solutions there, those uh, emissions will just continue to grow in the uh, lower and middle income countries because there aren't alternatives. Yeah, no, this, is, this is completely correct. So what, what I mean, the, the purpose of my institute is to try and put forward practical solutions to, to, um, to the big global challenges. And one of those obviously is around climate change. So the, the problem really is, is, is very simple. That in the end, you can you can make the case that the developed world created the problem, and so the developed world should deal with the problem. Hmm. But the truth is, the climate is is blind to where the emissions come from. They don't care whether you're developing or developed or or what country it is or what your politics um, are. So the, the the reality is that as developed countries have cut their emissions significantly over these past years and and you know there's been huge progress in in uh, many developed countries around the world on this issue nonetheless as the developing world grows of course it's consuming more energy and a lot of that energy is, is fossil fuel energy so the actual amount of primary energy coming from fossil fuels has barely shifted i mean the composition of it has shifted dramatically but the the level of it has remained very, very high. And so mm. the question is then, how do you, how does the developed world work in partnership with the developing world in order to deal with the fact that the bulk of the emissions are going to be coming from the developing world as it develops? And it's China, as you rightly say, because of course still there are hundreds of millions of people living um, in, in poverty in China or relative poverty. So China will, will grow and develop. India, of course, other parts of Asia. And then a lot of the work my institute does is in Africa, where over the next 30 to 40 years, the population will double. All of these countries will grow. Energy and energy production is absolutely vital for them in order to grow because you need electricity in order to have connectivity, in order to have connectivity, particularly to technology today. So there is no way that Africa can grow without damaging the climate unless it can grow sustainably. So this is, well, this, this yeah. is the thing we really focus on. No, well, I absolutely agree. And, you know, the, at the, the Hydropower Congress uh, commencing today, uh, there is being launched a San Jose Declaration on Sustainable Hydropower. And the, you know, I think that's particularly critical in, in Africa, uh, many other in, in, in Southeast Asia, where there are there are plenty of opportunities for further hydropower development, but it's absolutely vital that it's done in a way that has the support of local communities and above all is sustainable. Uh, and, you know, the interesting thing about hydropower though, Tony, 
is that we've always thought about it in the context of damming rivers and you know and making big dams but in fact in in pumped hydro in the context of pumped hydro all you need is two reservoirs they don't have to be huge uh, at differing elevations and so so you can create a, a reservoir on top of a hill and a reservoir at the bottom <clears throat> fill one of them with water and then just pump the water up when electricity is cheap and run it down to generate electricity when prices and, and demand is higher. And this off-river pumped storage is a huge opportunity uh, because you can do it in a way that is has negligible, no environmental Im impact and in particular doesn't affect any rivers or streams or um, you know ecosystems of that kind. Yeah, no, I, I think this is really important. I know you've done a lot of work on pumped hydro, and I think, Malcolm, for, for you know, for, for countries that where, where there is the possibility of, of having major hydro projects, it's obviously going to be really important that you don't try to cure one problem and create another. And that's mm. why the the, uh, the Congress Sustainability Standard, I think, will be a really important innovation. Um, and most important, by the way, will allow um, it will allow the international community to invest in those hydro projects. We might, my institute, because of the work we do with governments in Africa, are involved in several hydro projects. We've been involved in small projects in Guinea uh, for about 700 megawatts. There's a 1500 megawatt um, hydro project in Mozambique, um, the Fandakua that we are engaged in. Uh, there are other others happening in East Africa. There's one in the Tan Tanzania, Rwanda and Burundi, which is very important. And of course, there's the Inga um, Dam project, which is a, of a more traditional sort, but a massive project um, that's, that's, that's there to be done in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The, the challenge for a lot of African countries who, who in principle are very open to helping with this is not just, however, sustainability. It's also how do you attract investment? Hmm. Because, um, you know, there's, there's often substantial risks with these projects, either of a political nature, or the question is how, how do you manage to, to get a decent rate of return on investment if you want to attract private capital? And of course, you know, as, as you know better than me, these hydro projects are, you know, they're capital intensive. It requires a major investment up front. Now, I think one of the big challenges, um, and this is something we're looking at specifically, but I think it should be a big part of the COP26 discussions, is how do you mobilize international capital in support of these projects? Because the projects themselves are, are necessary and they're almost certainly viable if you can put together the right financial structure for them. Now, this is something which could be organized. You need to to guarantee and underwrite the political and financial risks. But if you don't do that, then it's really, you're leaving a lot of these countries with a very difficult choice because you can easily get financing for fossil fuel projects from the private sector of a, of a, um, you, you know, of a, of a reasonably manageable nature that can be established quickly. Mm. So if a country is desperate for electricity, then that is a very easy option for them to use. If you want them to switch into, into sustainable energy projects, you've got to create the financial structure that allows them to attract investment. Now, the good news is that the world's not short of, of, of money at the moment. There's, there's a lot of liquid cash out there searching for investment. So this is, this, this is where the it's so important to get practical policy making at the forefront of this, because if you really, you know, if you get the best minds around financial engineering to sit down and work out, for example, how you might finance some of these big hydro projects, as well as financing some of the, 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 the smaller um, off-river projects that you've just been describing, you know, they, if we do that, then we will release a lot of capital to come in and do the very things that we want to do. So this is, I think, a big, big challenge for the, the upcoming conversations in Glasgow. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, underwriting some of the risk is obviously the key, because as you say, there's a 
there's no shortage of money uh, available for investment, but uh, it's the cost and availability of it. So if the developed world can underwrite some of the risk uh, associated with these projects uh, and therefore make more finance more available, that's, you know, that's going to be a key to it. I mean, I think the other, the other thing, Tony, is that we've, you know, there are a lot of things that we've taken for granted uh, in, the, in electricity markets. Um, you know, the inertia, that is the frequency maintenance that comes from having big spinning machines in, you know, coal-fired power stations. Uh, and as we move to more uh, intermittent generation, as from wind farms or inverter-based systems like from solar panels, uh, that, you know, that frequ those frequency maintenance and other ancillary services has got to be provided. And this is where hydro is so important. And I, I think that the, uh, that all of us, and this is applies in right around the world, are going to have to get our heads around paying, in, paying for, incentivizing the creation of long duration storage. Um, I'm co-chairing a commission I'm on representing the International Hydro Power Association with the US government on pump storage. Uh, and that with their, that's their Department of Energy. And they recognise the need to work out how we're going to incentivise the more construction of it. And I think really we have to say, well, do we want to have, um, you know, the insurance of having uh, that big battery that is probably bigger than we are likely to use other than very occasionally, but nonetheless, it's got to be there. And so we've got to work out a way to do that. And the government in the UK, um, I have to say to their credit, is, is focusing on that. And I know the International Hydro Power Association's arguments have been, you know, I've presented them to, the, to the, your successor, Mr. Johnson, and, uh, and his ministers. So um, I, I think there's a, the, you know, the, the challenge always is for politicians or retired politicians like us, is we all know what to do, but we don't know how to do it and get re-elected. But I think the I think the the good news is that with the right planning, we've got the renewable technologies to deliver cheaper electricity, and at the same time reliable and more affordable electricity as long as we do the long-term planning. And that's the that's the critical thing. So in a sense, the scarcest resource resource uh, is not electrons but leadership and foresight. Yeah, I, I think, look, I mean, I know our government is taking very seriously um, the, the, um, the propositions that are put forward by the International Hydro Power Association. And I, I think, you know, they'll study what comes out of this, this Congress carefully. I think the, the, the will is there. It, it is a question of the way. And I, I think the... <laughs> You know, it's important to look at this from the point of view of, of the governments that are going to host these projects, because many of them will be in the developing world. And, you know, one of the, 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 the things my institute works on is really how we work with governments, we have teams of people go and work and uh, live in a country and work alongside the president or prime minister's team. On, on, and we focus on particular areas. There could be any area from education, health, investment, and so on, but we do work on energy. And the problem is for a lot of these countries, there is a lack of capacity. Um, sometimes, for example, the regulatory framework for power generation is, is poor, so people aren't clear that if they make, if, if the private sector comes in and makes an investment, will it get a proper rate of return? Yeah. It's not that you can't look around the world and find examples of people doing this and doing this well, but actually the actual process of governmental implementation is often difficult. And that's why I think that, you know, a lot of the focus should be not so much on, on winning the argument that this is important, because I think that argument can be reasonably easily won. The focus has really got to be, okay, so you are a, 
you're, you're, you're a, a, a country in the developing world, you do have limited capacity, you're not at the top, in the top rank of places where private capital is going to go and invest naturally. What is the, what is both, as I said earlier, the financial engineering and the regulatory framework that you require to put in place in order to be able to attract that investment and make these projects viable? And how does the international community support that? And I think that will be the, 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 the big issue because the, you see, a lot of that, as you rightly say, a lot of these projects are long-term, not merely financially viable, but they will reduce the cost of electricity, but they require a big upfront investment. And, you know, there will be a plethora of different things that, that people are in, in, in investing in, but we need to accelerate things like pumped hydro. We need to accelerate that far beyond what is presently, you know, you can see as viable projects in different parts of the world. And one other thing that I think is interesting is that if you take the past two years, or very nearly two years now, where the international community has been working on COVID, which is a crisis that came out of nowhere, has hit us all very, very hard. But if you think about the levels of innovation and ingenuity that occurred over these past 80 months as a result of the crisis, you know, there was, there's been a massive acceleration. I mean, to, to get, you know, okay, we, we still know there are big problems with vaccine, vaccine acquisition, distribution, and so on, but to get from where we were to, to where we are today, we have concertinaed the, the, the time um, for research, development, trialing, and, and distribution of vaccines in a remarkable way. Now, if you think about it, what that shows you, if, if you if you approach something with the requisite level of urgency and organization, you, you, you can do something which otherwise you would think is completely undoable uh, or unimaginable. And I really think the single most important thing for the, for the upcoming discussions in the international community is to take that sense of urgency and that level of organizational focus and apply it to climate. And if you do that, I think for, for things like hydropower, you can see how you could accelerate massively the deployment and development of, of, of hydropower. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, Tony, I absolutely agree. Well, here we are um, just um, weeks away from the COP. Uh, what's, your, what, what's your message for the leaders at the, as they assemble in Glasgow? So I think the most important thing with any of these summits is that, as you will also know well from your experience, Martin, is that the summit succeeds or fails by the work that's done beforehand. I mean, once the leaders all come together, I mean, you know, of course, there, 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 there can be breakthroughs at the last moment and deals struck at, at the last moment, but the actual practical work has to be done now and in, in the lead up to the, you know, to the final discussion. So you've got, September, October, November, effectively, to, to, to put this in place. And my strong advice to my own government has been focus on practical plans. And you've got to focus particularly on this issue to do with how we help the developing world grow sustainably. Because otherwise, a lot of the pressure internally on our politics is all about, well, what are we doing as Britain? And then, or what are you doing as Australia? Yeah. Well, that's obviously important, but and of course, we should, be, we should be setting an example, and the example itself is important. But in the end, you know, the, the simple truth is, unless we can ensure that the poorer parts of the world develop sustainably, we're, we're not going to win this battle. And, you, you know, you, you, you've had your um, fires in Australia and in California, we've had floods in the UK and the rest of Europe, you know, you look around the world today, you, can, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't think you need to convince people much any longer that this is a serious problem. I mean, I think you've got a few refuse things holding out, but but on the whole, it's pretty clear this is a big problem. So it's all now about focus and implementation. And that, that would be my advice to the government. And uh, you know, that what we're discussing now is a classic example. We know it can make a big difference. We know there are big projects that need to be done and other small scale projects. And we know what the problem is. The problem is putting it together with the right financing and the right regulatory framework and underwriting the political risks. 
I absolutely agree with you. Well, Tony, thank you very much. Uh, it's been great to see you again.